Lisa Mason Ziegler coming to you here live from the Fulfillment Center. I am back at the Fulfillment Center, and I don't know if you can hear him, but Tucker is whining to be over here with me. My goodness, friends. So anyway, Tucker and I came up here to the Fulfillment Center a little bit early today, um, and I'm just happy to be here to answer some of your questions. Um, so friends, if you've never joined us before for an Ask a Flower Farmer, um, here's the deal. You can post any of your questions related to growing flowers, whether you're a home gardener or a flower farmer, whether it's seed starting, business, cool flowers, whatever you got, post it down below in the little circle with the question mark in it. And I'm feeling pretty certain we're gonna have a lot of cool flower questions. I don't know about you, but I am blooming knee deep in cool flower transplants. And still start bobos at home on the farm, starting more. Um, and, you know, I don't know about you. We're, so we're here in southeastern Virginia. And while it is still warm days and the nights are not, I wouldn't call them cool. They just aren't hot anymore. And we have already seen a marked decline um, in our actual harvest. And that's not only from cooler temperatures. That's also from shorter day lengths. And... Um, so the combination of those two really starts slowing down our classic warm season tender annuals that we just continue to cut right up until harvest, right? Like, you know, cocks comb and all the plumes and, um, yeah, y'all come on in. The, the crew is filing in from lunch here. Um, and they still continue to produce, but much slower. They don't get as big, but they're still really, really useful. But those flowers that do start kicking are the flowers like, you know, Cosmos. And if you happen to grow dahlias, I don't. Um, dahlias, that's what makes them really start to really kick it, is that short day length really kicks them into high gear. Um, and Cosmos also do that. But we're still cutting a lot of different crops, but just not many, um, not not quite so many. And I see my friend Janice is on here from Canada, Harris Flower Farm. And Janice DM'd me this morning to just, she's so proud of her cool flowers she direct sowed. She has Bells of Ireland, I know. And um, so I'm just, it's... It's really hopeful this time of the year when you plant cool flowers. That's how I feel about all of our transplants. Y'all, when I tell you that I've gone a little overboard on snapdragons, that might be like an understatement. You cannot even believe how many snapdragons I have started. And they look awesome and well as Rudbeckias. And let's see, I could go on and on. Status and st not stock. Um, status and what else do I? Oh, Sweet William. Oh, my God. Just so many. And, you know, the bottom line rule is this. If something is winter hardy, where in your winter hardiness zone, then you definitely should, you benefit greatly from fall planting it. And as we know, there's a lot of people um, that are experimenting, like Janice, I think Janice is in zone six. Um, and, you know, we didn't know that Bells of Ireland were, would winter over in zone six, but um, beyond her, I know other growers that are actually wintering over Bells of Ireland outdoors in a garden, probably using low tunnels, but it's still outside and having great success. So we're always experimenting, right? So before we jump in, I want to remind again, if you have a question related to anything to do with growing flowers, um, flower farming, home gardener, seed starting, cool flowers, whatever. Just post it down in the little bubble with the question mark. That way I won't miss it when I'm scrolling through all of the comments. So I wanted to just tell you a couple announcements. First off, I am holding, do y'all know what this is? This is a Japanese sod cutter. This is what they use, the style of knife they use to cut sod on sod farms, you know, when they're cutting them up or when they're installing sod in people's yards. This is the most useful, amazing little tool. Let me take him out of his little jacket here. It's got a serrated edge. See that there? So you don't sharpen it ever. Um, I have some of these that are so old and rusty because they've been left outside and they still cut like nobody's tomorrow. I use it for not only harvesting greens. That's one thing this time of the year, you know, when you start getting back into lettuces and kales and all that kind of and collards and mustards and all that stuff. 
This is a super quick and easy, useful tool for that. But friends, it does so much more than that. I don't cut flowers with this, um, but I literally use it to cut plants out of the ground. Like if I want a chunk of hosta or some perennial that's growing, instead of digging the whole thing up, I literally cut it out of the ground with this. I stick this down in the dirt. You should use something like this for the things you shouldn't use your clippers for, right? And you know what else I use it for? There's one of these on every tractor and mower that we have on our farm um, because you can use this to cut the string that gets wrapped around stuff. You can use it to cut through irrigation that gets wrapped around um, bush hogs because somebody forgot to pull it up. Um, super useful tool. It's like 10 bucks. Anyway, you'll find this over at thegardenersworkshop.com. And this also is the best $10 you could spend on a gift. Um, you know, Christmas is only 100 days or so away. And I only say that because we just got a huge shipment in of a lot of special items that we'll be offering um, over on our um, phone app, our live shopping shows on Fridays. If you haven't joined me over there, friends, download the app, find it at your phone app store, Gardener's Workshop Live Shop, download it, join me on Fridays. Um, we have special offers. Um, the special offers go are, remain good throughout the weekend, um, but there's stuff over there that we don't sell on our big website, um, and so you'll find some of that, um, but I just had, I just was walking from the restroom to right here and passed by the shelf of these and thought, I guess got to tell you all about this. This is undoubtedly one of those tools you could carry um, on your belt and use it for so many things. Love it. Best 10 bucks and a great little stocking stuffer, but it's just a great gift. I mean, every girlfriend, every friend you have that has a yard would love this. All right. So I see we got a bunch of questions. Um, so before that, so remember to join me on Friday. Um, so new time for Ask a Flower Farmer is 1230. Um, and we are running straight into cool flower season around here in southeastern Virginia. My first frost date is mid-November. So we spend the month of October planting. Um, we should be getting beds ready, but I face the same dilemma that all of you do. You don't want to rip out stuff that's blooming. So I wait to the last minute, which is always, um, you know, a mistake, but I do it anyway. And um, anyway, so let's see what you guys have um, for me. All right, wait a minute. I hit the wrong button. There we go. All right. So where did the great Lysianthus commentary from last night from last night go? Only saw half. So if you're talking about that you requested the the webinar that I did on Lysianthus, um, if I don't think that gets down. I don't think it has a link that you can revisit it, but all you have to do is um, click on it again and just request it because when you request it, it automatically comes there. So if you DM me that, I can find the, I'm, I'm sure I have the link. Somebody, I mean, we have people that do that. That's beyond me, y'all. Um, but yeah, we have people that do that. I'm sure I can get that link. So if you DM me that question, I'll be able to get you the answer for that, okay? All right, so here's a great question. You've mentioned that your triloba patch was perennial. Do you leave alone to self-seed or sow more yourself? So it's not actually perennial, I guess. I mean, depends on how you're using the word perennial. Um, triloba is actually kind of like a biennial, reseeding, hardy annual. It's not a long-lived plant, but it readily reseeds itself constantly. And so... The very first year that we've, I figured this out was that big, I have a, like a 90 foot long, um, I bet it's 15 feet wide now, patch of triloba. We've now infiltrated it with other native perennials, um, with other native plants that are perennials like Joe Pie Weed um, and Rudbeckia Maxima. Anyway, um, you know, I had double planted a bed there, two rows, um, because that gets such a large plant, right? And then we just didn't get around to tearing it down. And then that next spring, there were so many that had receded. I left them, and that was the beginning of that party. I literally have done nothing to that patch. All we do is mow the perimeter to keep it neat and tidy. 
we don't reseed, we don't replant. It just takes care of itself. And now that we have so very, very much of it, we have started adding um, other native perennials in there, as I mentioned. Um, you know, Joe Pie and other types of Rudbeckia um, are just so really good um, in there. So once you have it, you don't ever have to plant it again um, is my question. Short stop flowers who is in zone three. So she is in Sashquan. I'm sure I didn't say that right. My Gumphrina head stayed small. Any idea why? Um, so Gumphrina is a warm season tender annual. And um, I was just, um, I was just thinking about writing something about this that warm season tender annuals, particularly those folks that live more north, their day length and their sun is a little different than ours. Gumphrena, as well as like a lot of the celosias and even zinnias, I mean, they really need that heat um, and brilliant light to really give you whopper size stuff. So I would probably say that could be it. And that's why I know a lot of people, which is not you, but people in the um, Pacific Northwest actually grow coxcomb oftentimes in houses to help heat it up to get those bigger heads. I would almost guess that the same thing could be happening with Gumphrena, just because you may not get the high temperatures that they like so much. So Pink Petal asks, what can be cool flower planted or sown now if you have not started seed block, if you have not started soil blocking? I'm in zone 8B. Well, so... Your zone, again, first off, I want to say that, you know, cool, fl cool Flowers, the book, is out of stock everywhere. We have all are patiently waiting for it. For anybody that um, has been looking for it, we wished we had the book to sell right now, but we don't. Um, but it, your zone, your winter hardiness zone, only tells you what you can plant in the fall, basically. It doesn't tell you when. It's your frost dates that are paramount, paramount to that six to eight weeks before your first historical frost is your target time of getting stuff in the ground, whether that be direct seeded or transplanted. I would guess with you being 8B, you are not too late. You need to start so you can, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that prefers to be transplanted and does better. Um, we do probably about probably about 85% transplants for cool flowers and just a handful of those that we direct. So, so that's the real question is when is your frost date? Um, and I can promise you, you're not too late because here's the other thing. That's, this is, that's the question I'll be asked literally a million times before December. What you have to know is that you have tweaky time when you're talking about planting transplants outside because you can plant them, hoop and row cover them with lightweight row cover and buy yourself like a month back. Um, so you have plenty of time to start them. Direct seeding, you have to be a little bit more um, attentive to the date because they need to be sown outdoors um, in that window when there's still some warmth but the nights are cool. Tips to get Ami to germinate now indoors using cookie cooling rack on heat mat. Are these one of the ones you put on heat for 24, then take off and put on the ground? Yes. And so I just, mine is popping as we speak. Um, and I will tell you when I moved it up. So my grow room has the door open right now. My grow room is on in a building that's heated and air conditioned, right? And so um, the Ami... We put on the heat for about 24 to 36 hours, and then we take it off, and then I just slid it up on the top of one of our racks, And but that room is fairly cool, um, but you could actually put that cookie, that rack, that tray of blocks anywhere in a coolish type room, which is about 65 degrees or lower. Um, and ours are, I was just noticing when I watered them this morning, I had about half of them germinate a few days ago. Now there's a whole nother um, set that are cracking. So obviously I didn't do something right. Any, let's see. Any thoughts on why only one flower on my Lysianthus opens? Um, the question would be, are you talking about on the plant or after you cut it? Um, we cut Lysianthus when three to four blooms are open, um, assuming that there's no rain in the forecast. You know, if it, there's rain coming and there's two blooms open, I may cut it. Um, but 
that would depend on if it's in the vase or in, you know, out in the field, right? Bare root perennials planted in spring, watered well all season, but no signs of growth. Are they goners or just sleeping? Well, they wouldn't be growing now. They're going into their sleeping time, right? So if you planted them, I mean, you'll just have to wait and see. That's why I do not like bare root plants. It is just so hard to see what's going on. I mean, I like to buy more mature potted with vegetation because it's this waiting game that's very difficult. So yeah, I think they're probably just sleeping. So just don't even worry about, don't plant anything on top of them. Um, just wait and see. It's in spring. Once the soil starts to warm up, which is usually um, around that time of your last frost date um, and the, the month following that. What other cool season annuals do you treat like Ami? Germination, Dara, Bells, and Bupleurum. So, yes, um, so Dara and Bupleurum, not Bupleurum. Um, we direct sow Bupleurum in the fall for a 100% much better experience. Um, it's still not cold enough in my room to get Bupleurum um, to pop. Um, Bells of Ireland, I tried that method on last year, and I just didn't have very good luck. But I am going to be trying, priming, doing something a little bit different, and I'll keep you posted. But we direct sow Bupleurum and Bells of Ireland in the fall and have great germination. So here's a question. If you cut Lysianthus with three flowers open, do you still get the same shelf life? Yes. I mean, if not even longer. And um, so if you use flower food with Lysianthus stems, um, many of the buds that are there, the more mature ones, will continue to open. And when you give them food, they don't fade. Um, so, yes, and it's a far better value for your customer. We put less stems in a bunch or less stems in a bouquet when more flowers are open. I mean, my goal in a dream world, if I was growing in a hoop house, that's why a hoop house Lizzie is awesome because they can let all, um, so many of the blooms open, like five to seven. I mean, five to seven blooms open on one stem makes that a much higher value product. Um, but out in the field, you have to really be mindful because of rain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, three to five, three to four is what I normally get. Um, but five would be a dream. And, yes, they still last. Just their, their vase, the vase life on Lysianthus is pretty dadgum remarkable. Um, no, I do not grow. I do have Linaria um, that reseeds on my farm. That's a true biennial. That's not a cool season hardy annual. Um, as well as, I don't know about Tweedia. I've never grown it. Um, and it's something that I'll experiment, can't experiment with it this year. I have too many experiments, too many fingers in a pie right now anyway. Um, so, how do I get it to be tall? So, if in fact Tweedia is a cool season hardy annual, and I can't confirm that either way because I haven't looked into it, um, if I would definitely try fall planting it if you don't live in a really, um, you know, if you live in zone 8, 9, or 10, for sure. Um, and um, I would experiment and plant some in the fall, but I would definitely try planting it in very early spring. That's probably what's going to get you the longer stem length, so give that a try. So I mean, I'm trying, some of the times these long questions don't, I have to go back and look at them because they don't display properly. Ugh, I just lost that one. Let me see if I can get it back. There it is. What about hardy annuals that the package says direct sow when ground can be worked, but the same seed can be direct sown in my zone? Do I follow the six to eight weeks? until frost or until it until it's colder. So I don't really understand your question, but to hopefully clear the cloud for you, first off, when you read on a seed packet, direct sow when ground can be worked, that is one of those flags to me that says, hey, that's probably a cool season hardy annual. And um, 
then I investigate that, right? And if it's a cool season hardy annual, then you need to start investigating and see if you can find out by search engines. If it's not on our website, it what winter what zone is it winter hardy to? And that'll tell you when to plant it, fall or very early spring. If it's very early spring, we don't do any direct sowing then because um, there's not enough heat to get them to germinate. So if you're still on here, seeds, flower truck, I'd love to know what you're talking about. What plant, what flower you're talking about. Morning, I think you tried Lysianthus planting the fall and spring. Which did you find was the best? So good question. I did do an experiment um, this past year. Bobo and I planted um, the same Lysianthus plugs because we buy plugs we do not start it from seed although i am trying to start some from seed this year as an experiment um and those planted in the fall did not bloom any sooner nor any taller and in fact bobo said this very early spring planted lizzie's actually were an inch or two taller <laughs> so the bottom line is and see the problem with if there's not really a strong benefit for you to fall plant, the problem is if you're ordering plugs like we do, you have to buy a number of trays. So it's like if you could eliminate one of those plantings and the pro one of the problems with fall planting is because Lysianthus is so, um, so very sensitive to wet feet, which is a problem for cool season annuals that grow through the winter. You have to really have excellent drainage. They get root rot super easy. Um, and we lost about half of ours to that because I didn't treat them with root shield, which is um, a product you dip them in. It's actually like a, a rhizome, a rhizom. It's a bacteria. It's not a um, chemical. And it helps it to fight off that. And we didn't do that. So... Our conclusion is we are only very early spring planting, meaning we plant our lizzies eight weeks before our last frost, and we get stellar tall stems, and I would recommend that you listen to the podcast I did with Dave Dowling. It's called Field and Garden Podcast is the name of my podcast, and go through there. Dave and I did a Lizzianthus um, podcast, and he talks about, you know how you see the group numbers on Lizzianthus just like snaps? Well, they don't mean the same thing as snaps. But I did learn that if you're planting um, the later groups, like number threes and fours, grow long, bloom a little bit later. And what that means is the stems grow longer before they bloom. So if you're fighting short stems and lizzies, that's what you need to look for. So I hope that answers your question. Creekside, the last two years, I have lost half of my Campanula in early spring to white mold. I treated with Zeratol and trialed low caterpillar tunnels to controlled water. Any suggestions or thoughts to prevent that? You know, I do not have that. Um, I have never had that problem. Um, and so I don't know if you got a an official. I mean, white mold can be a lot of different things, I think. Um, I would definitely sample it and get the exact name of it and find out from your extension agent. Those are the people that can give you the science. Not to mention people like Stanton Gill, who is, um, not Stanton Gill. We have some biologists, microbiologists folks that work with cut flower universities that can give you better information, but they need to know exactly what kind it is. And that would be simply me and taking a sample, send, asking your extension agent to send it off, Oftentimes, if you're a grower, commercial, you don't even have to pay for that um, and get a real answer so you know what you really need to do. But a lot of times that is from either poor germinate, I mean, poor drainage, um, a wet season like you obviously already knew that. Um, but yeah, I would get a better answer and to find out what steps you can take to actually help to prevent that. Crooked letter roots. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for being such a wonderful teacher. Can you please talk about watering and hooping cool flowers? Well, you're so welcome. Hey, y'all. And guess what? October 1st, Flower Farming School enrollment opens. That's my online course. And you know what? I'm just going to tell you like it is. It's 600 bucks. It's the best $600 you'll ever spend. I'm telling you. There's just so much great information. Um, I was listening to a business person talk the other day, and it's like, 
you know what? You have got to invest in yourself. Stop all this running around gathering information. Um, what we've really tried to create is the ba uh, my course, Flower Farming School Online, the basics is about the basics, annual crops, marketing, and more. It's really about building a strong foundation before you start growing all that fancy stuff, um, getting your customers lined up and learning how to sell, and would love to have you join me. It's a six-week course. You have access to it forever. And, friends, we have created a special tool within that course that only my course students have access to, and that is the Cool Flowers Field Growers Report. And that is a database that you can access to see what other growers buy the flower. I mean, you can search it and get all kinds of information, but it's a way for all of us to contribute what experience we're having in different zones so that other people can see it and benefit from it and actually contribute. It's like the most amazing tool ever. Um, and at this point in time and it, for the next you know little while, couple years, year at least, that is only available to my students. So that alone is another great benefit. I won't sell it anymore. Um, but friends, come to school. Um, so watering cool flowers. So we definitely for fall, you know, I fall in very early spring plant. We always install irrigation tea tape whenever we make our beds. Um, we rarely use it. That's the honest to goodness truth. Um, when we actually are planting, whether it's direct seeded or actually our direct seeded beds don't get irrigation placed in them because then you can't cultivate properly. Um, but our transplants get tea tape in them. Um, but we still don't use that tea tape to water the new plantings. We always hand water our direct seeded stuff and our transplants right when we plant. And if you're planting at the optimal time, meaning cool nights, warmish days, and you're heading into winter, um, they really don't need a lot. We get a lot of rain here and we get rain pretty regularly. So we don't have to um, do a lot of watering, but definitely provide water once a week if you are not getting adequate rain. Um, and so the other point of why we don't use our irrigation in the fall is it doesn't put water into the tubing, which would make it a freezing varmint chewing problem all throughout winter. Um, and then of course in spring, we'll use it if need be, but we famously also have wet springs. Um, so, you know, that is, you don't, what you have to remember, these flowers are growing through the cool season. The soil does not dry out, um, and you just have to have excellent drainage because, let me tell you, they will croak in no time. Um, there's all kinds of yummy diseases that are just waiting for your soil to get wet and clogged up, um, and it will just consume the roots of your cool season hardy annuals. So you really have to be stellar about where you choose and make really raised beds. It just is It's very, very beneficial. Um, and we only hoop our cool flowers when we have to. We've learned that hooping automatically just encourages disease and pests. I mean, you're making a little microclimate under there, right? Um, so the only we always have them in place and ready, ready to roll. So if we're doing a deep dive suddenly one night, I can just pull the covers up. Um, and then if we're having a lot of wind, I'll pull them up. But we don't put them on and leave them like we used to 20 years ago. It's just not cold enough all winter. Um, and we, it, it just really helps to prevent disease and pests to not use um, covers that much. So we use them, but we use them very differently than we used to. What resource will tell me how much water specific flower types need I heard that asters don't like a lot of water. How can I find that information? I do not know where that information is. In general, um, all plants, you know, need to be in excellent drainage, which that mean, what that means, and with good soil, meaning the high organic matter in your soil, which means it retains a lot of the moisture, needs approximately an inch a week. Um, and then there are some flowers like hydrangeas and dahlias love a lot of water too. Um, but that those are things that you learn from experience and from other growers. Um, I, don't, I can't grow asters, so I can't speak to that. But there is no resource that is specific about that for flowers. 
Fly girl, have you found the Zowie Xenia to be shorter than the Benaries and Queen, Li Queen Lime series longer between blooms? Funny you should ask this. Um, we have one minute left, y'all. I'll only take one more question after this. Um, yesterday, Bobo and I were eating lunch, and we were facing one of the fields that has the zinnias. And um, I have the tallest zinnia, the tallest Zowie Xenia we have ever grown. I bet it's 36 inches tall. Um, with watering and proper planting time, um, our Zowies are kicking, just like uproar. Um, so, But that has not been my experience beforehand, I'll tell you. So they aren't as productive as Benary's Giants, I don't think, and Queen's. But they are worth, I mean, this time of the year, I would only grow them for fall harvest, right? Because, or late summer, just because that's a, such a great color, right? Um, so, yeah, they aren't quite. I call those the specialty zinnias. Um, and we grow a select handful um, to have for, you know, specialty stuff. But those were not our production zinnias. How do you water and fertilize your cool flower bed? Do you run your irrigation at all during the winter? Um, so all of our beds get a dose of um, dry organic fertilizer, which you'll find that at thegardenersworkshop.com. We package it. You can read more about it and what it is. Um, we put that down according to the directions that's on that bag, which you can also see on online. Um, we put all that down. And so then that's all they get until spring. And I'll be really honest that most often they really don't ever get anything else because we just don't ever get to it. Um, but there are surely benefits, um, particularly in spring after growth starts, you start seeing shoots and stuff starting to elongate after you have thinned anything that needed to be thinned, direct sown stuff. Um, that's a great time to foliar feed um, with the Neptune seaweed fish. I mean, that's a great time. It is stinky, so you would never do that when they've got buds on them. This is something to do just to kind of like give them a wake up from spring. Um, but we basically just follow the directions. Um, all right, friends, it is after one o'clock and I have to go pay bills and um, push paper on my desk. Um, and thank you so much for joining me. Remember to grab the Gardener's Workshop Live Shop app and join me Fridays at 12 noon. We really have a ton of fun because you know what's there. It's all a harvest that Bobo is doing today and tomorrow. And we have some really pretty, oh my gosh, the white swan marigolds are absolutely phenomenal. And I'm telling you, they are for fall. Um, I would set that succession up to have it all during the month of August, September, and October. And you know, marigolds famously can take a little bit of um, cold. Um, and the white swans are just and they're low fragrance which makes the bunnies eat them so you have to really protect them from bunnies um but anyway that's what i'm showing you i saw a real pretty bucket full of those white swans that i'll be showing um folks on friday during the show so you just join me in the app there's special offers and bundles and we just have a lot of fun i've given you the 411 on the flowers that we have and we've got four different types of eucalyptus all of which we have three of those seeds available. One of them is still out of stock, you know, with Australia having those fires. That's what's really affected the eucalyptus seeds. So, friends, get the seed while you can. Um, but I'll be showing four of those tomorrow, and you can get on the wait list for the silver drop. We are hopeful that it'll be coming maybe this year um, after this season is over. But we have the other three that I love all of them. They're absolutely and this is the time of year, right? So Bobo's cutting that. You'll see that tomorrow on the show. And I can't wait to meet you guys there. All right, friends, until we meet again. Ciao.